thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Jo Holmes, I'm the Partnerships Lead at Now Teach. And just to sort of let you know what, this the, what the purpose of the session is about, um, we're hoping to give you a real insight into what it's like to be in a school, um, be a trainee in a school. Normally, under normal circumstances, obviously you'd be spending time going in visiting schools, observing lessons, talking to teachers while you're there. Um, with the schools currently closed, you're not able to do that. And we're really conscious that that's a really, really important part of preparing yourself to teach. Um, and that it can cause some um, people are feeling nervous about the fact that they haven't been able to get into school. So there's a lot of information on our website about uh, and ways you can inform yourself about the school in environment. But we're really hoping that this will give you a good insight into what it's like to be a, to be a teacher. We've got three of our trainees um, with us. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully you'll you'll get a great insight into the school environment this evening. Um, I think the majority of people with us this evening have actually passed the the Now Teach um, interview process. You're all part of the Now Teach network. Uh, quite a lot of you have already got places in schools. Um, quite a lot of you have got interviews sort of set up, but you're all quite a way. Uh, most of you are quite a, quite a way down your journey. Um, so yeah, so this will just be sort of giving giving you more information um, uh, for for sort of interviews and then to prepare yourself for training in September. Um, we've got the session will due to run for about an hour and a quarter this evening. Uh, we've got three um, current current trainees with us, three members of the Now Teach Network who are currently in their training year um, from different regions, different subjects, sort of having different experiences. So they're going to all um, be giving you a really good insight into what their journey's been like um, and we'll also be asking you to submit some questions if there are particular things you'd like answered so we'll um, let you know how to do that um, in, a, in a few slides time there'll be instructions on how to submit questions if you're not sure about that um, but I'll just to let you know as well that we are recording the session this evening so if you're not able to stay for all of it then uh, there will be a recording of the session so we will be sending that out to you um, we have got some of the same panelists. Some of you, I think, joined us a few weeks ago when we ran the first webinar. Um, some of our panelists are the same, uh, but we have some different different questions. The content will be slightly different, so don't assume it's going to be the same all the way through. Hopefully, you'll learn some new things. So please stick with us. Okay. Uh, so before we sort of kick off the Q and A, we have got some a couple of polls for you, just to get an idea of what. Uh, what stage of the of the journey you're at and, and who we've got with us. So if you could just take a couple of seconds to complete this one, please. Okay, so yes, it looks as though over half of you have already got a training place. Congratulations. Um, and again, about a, another third have passed the interview uh and some have been offered a training place it says so um whether you're still making the making the decision or maybe um deciding between different offers so that's great and i think we've got another one more poll if you could please complete this one as well Just giving us a little bit more information about what it is that you really want to find out more about again I can see student behaviour, um, it's very very common that people uh, want to find out more about student behaviour and our trainees will certainly be letting you have the benefit of their experience. Um, time commitment needed, yeah so lots of um, quite quite a spread there of um, information. Yeah so 74 percent um, have concerns about student behaviour, again we'll hopefully uh, the trainees will talk about sort of how they've dealt with student behaviour and, and the, the training that you are given in order to arm you with um, techniques for behaviour management. Um, fear of failure, that's again sort of very, very common um, starting again time commitment. So yeah, we'll, we'll hope to cover all of those in the sessions in the session this evening. Thank you very much for those. Uh, and just before we do start the Q&A, we have got a short film to show you. So if we can pop the film on now, that'd be great.
sometimes I'm here at school as early as 6.30 in the morning, which uh, I, I know it sounds crazy, but uh, you can do a lot of, uh, you can sort out a lot of things when it's quiet in the morning. It's way earlier than what I used to do or even remember, and it's incredible how time flies in the morning. So 8.30 is kickoff, the first lesson of the day. The younger kids are bouncy full of beans, I need to calm them down while the older kids might be more sleepy and need waking up for the day. At 10 past 10, I'm thinking about wrapping up the lesson, why I haven't wrapped up the lesson in time, because I've got to run downstairs to the next floor in time for my sixth form tutor group. Will I make it on time? That's what I'm thinking. We have registration after the end of the first lesson, and that's also known as tutor time. Uh, that's where we get together with our form. I have a sixth form and we talk about some really interesting things. And one thing I've been able to do is tell them about current affairs, a bit about UK politics. Um, I've been able to tell them what I know about Brexit, which has been really interesting, but also give them lots of practical advice. How do you get a mortgage? How do you buy a car? And I found that one of the most satisfying parts of the job. 11 o'clock on a Thursday, um, I have a free period. So what I like to do is go down to the staff room and spend some time comparing notes with my colleagues, um, including others who are also doing the training programme this year. So the day doesn't finish at three when the bell rings. I have to visit any kids in detention, ring home to parents, mark their work, plan their lessons for the next day. But by five o'clock, I am finished. I don't take any work home. I leave the building and I go off to do my other job, my own kids and my own family. Okay, so there were some of our current now teachers in situ. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, so we will now start our Q&A session with our current trainees. So I'd like to welcome Rob, Francis and Nathan, who should be appearing. Hi, Rob. Hello. Hi, Francis. Hi. And any second now? Nathan, are you there? <laughs> I am, sorry. Oh, hi, brilliant. Kept us in suspense. Great, welcome. Lovely. Thank you very much, all three of you, for um, joining the panel this evening. Um, if you'd like to just introduce yourselves, give a little bit of an overview of, of who you are, where, what you were doing before you came to teaching and what you're teaching now. Okay, I'll kick off. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Rob Eckersley. I spent about 25 years as an academic at university studying the application of physics to medicine and um, during that time I did more and more teaching and I realized I enjoyed it and then when I had my own kids I realized that I was really interested in how children develop so I became more and more fascinated with teaching younger children so I decided to make the change to become a school teacher. I I'm on a training program where since last September I've been placed in a school so it's a in-school training program uh, with the ARC training network and the school that I'm in is in London near Brixton called ARC Evan and Grace Academy and I teach science all of Thanks. science <laughs> yeah it says physics there but you do have to teach all three sciences don't you as a science teacher while you're training um, okay, thank you Francis. Hi, I'm Francis Castle. Um, I um, joined the army uh, over 30, well over 30 years ago. Um, and I was going to, my plan was then to join the army, do three years in the army and then go and do teacher training and, um, and get a, a proper job. However, I didn't end up doing that. I met my husband, um, married him, had three children, stayed in the army um, and finally came to the end of my army career, um, did a full career in the army um, last year. And so I um, have decided to, to do what I was supposed to be doing many years ago um, and train as a modern languages um, teacher in French and Spanish. So I'm now living in Shropshire. I'm at studying at the University of Chester. It's a PGCE programme. Um, and as I said, in, in French and Spanish. Lovely. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Nathan Halton. Um, I was a corporate lawyer, um, like Rob. I did that for about 25 years. Um, and I have thought about teaching at different points in life. And like a lot of people had always thought there wasn't the right time for it, um, but decided that I had now reached 
the right time uh, last year. So I am currently um, work, teaching at uh, Jane Austen School in Norwich, and I'm on the in-school training program with Inspiration Trust. Great, thank you. Um, so we have got some sort of questions for each of the trainees, but we would, yeah, just to run through what we're going to be talking about, um, the school environment, again, just trying to give you a bit of an idea of what it's like to actually be in a school um, on the grounds that you can't actually physically visit schools at the moment. Um, a bit more about the school day, so exactly what goes on during the school day when you're a teacher, when you're a trainee, all the different things you get involved with. Um, the actual experience of a trainee and again a bit more about what it's like to, to be a trainee um, and then some of our panellists advice um, or, or words to themselves from a year ago. Uh, so that's what we are, will be covering with the sort of the formal part of the Q&A. We'd also love you to submit some questions yourselves if there are other parts that we haven't covered. So on the screens now is a slide just explaining how we do that. Um, there's a little chat box on the, the side bar of the, the GoToWebinar function um, and you just enter, enter a question there. So if you put your questions in there, then they'll get picked up. We might well not have time to answer them all, obviously, but we um, please do submit them and, and, and we'll certainly sort of come back to you at a later date if we haven't been able to answer your questions this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so if we kick off, um, with the school environment, um, Rob, can you sort of think back to that first, <laughs> those first days, maybe even when you did a school experience yourself, you walked into a secondary school for the first time in quite a long while, um, what was your sort of initial impressions um, of, of, of the school? Hmm. Well, I think the, the thing that I, I would like to get across the most is the kind of mad energy of a school you when you're in a school certainly the kind of school that i teach in at the moment and also the schools i visited before it, there's not a moment to take stock there's not really a moment to breathe during the day there, there's so much energy in the place that it can feel a little bit overwhelming to start with uh but it's something that i guess you you, you need to thrive off that kind of energy because otherwise it would be it would be too much um the, the the there are there are so many different things going on all day long and i think we're going to talk about those in more detail as, a, as the, the session goes on but i guess my most my, the, the most the thing that struck me right from the beginning the first time i went to a school was you know i visited science department for a few days and i remember how the teachers constantly would teach one lesson or maybe to some year sevens on one topic you know they'd be teaching i don't know re reproduction to year sevens and then they'd have to teach uh, the periodic table to year nines then they'd be teaching physics to year tens and then it would be break time and then they'd be teaching and all day long the topics were changing the year groups were changing they never had a moment to stop there was so much going on there's so much energy that the time just disappears the time just disappears and so that was my overwhelming first impression so much going on in the school yeah and you liked that sort of atmosphere didn't you you were attracted to it to being in that kind well, of environment well yeah i was very attracted to that kind of environment because i quite liked the fact that it kind of you have to be able to be carried along by it um but but yeah i was definitely drawn to that environment yeah Great, thank you. Francis, what were you, obviously you're on a PGCE route, so your sort of first few weeks were in the university. Um, what, what were your first impressions when you finally sort of got into a secondary school to do some observing of classes to start off with? Yeah, I spent um, three weeks at university and then essentially we were out, out at schools um, for four days of the week and then back at university on a Friday. That's how it's been up to up till now. Um, I suppose my, my first impression was just the busyness of it, the number of people in the corridors moving around between classes and between lessons and the physical lack of space. So, you know, you, you have to go up a, up a staircase and coming down the staircase is just a whole wave of, of, of children and you just have to you just have to wait and you just have to hope that they will let you pass and, and so on but you know they don't necessarily do that and they, they don't necessarily think, oh there's because you know, they don't know who they don't know who you are on day yeah. one whereas if another teacher who they know well they would automatically sort of stand aside and and depending on the behavior um regime in the school but the two schools that i 
been on placement have had very different um, cultures, I think. And the first one was a very, very um, strict, very um, hard over discipline, um, whereas the second one, much, much less so. And I haven't decided yet which I which I like best. I suppose I need to still go into a third school to really decide which is which is the best. But I suppose the other thing was the size of the classes and the difference, because a GCSE class, there might be 15 in a class, but actually you might be able to break up into fives and, and tens whereas the rest of the classes are all you know, 30 strong every single class it's 30 children in the class and that's quite a lot to have to handle um when you first go in but you get so much support you 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 watch other people doing it first you you watch their techniques and of course you're going into somebody else's class they're not your children they're somebody else's class and so you really model i found out sort of modeled what i did on on the way the teacher did it to start with anyway um but but you know that the, they are it was fine i mean all my worries you know yes it's difficult it's challenging but um you know the overall um impression was it, it was pretty much what i expected i think right yeah you touched on the fact that most classes were sort of 30 students yeah. um yeah. are they mixed ability or sort of were were they set it at all or again i know that varies from school to school but what was your experience in my school, um, both schools, they were both completely mixed ability, which is, is a challenging in itself when you've got some really bright children in there um, and some, some less able children. Um, but you soon work out who they are. I mean, you're, you're briefed in ahead, of, ahead of time who they are. Um, but differentiating the classes so that you produce something for everybody um, is, is something that has to be done in, with mixed ability in particular. Yeah, great. Nathan, I think you said when you when you first walked into school, it actually felt quite familiar to you. Is that right? It did. I, I went to a secondary school uh, that felt very similar to the one I walked into. It obviously didn't have whiteboards when I was there, but um, you know, the, as has already been talked about, um, and I don't think anything we say today will be that surprising for people. But it's worth just thinking about these things: the noise, uh, the way the corridors fill up, um, the smell was very very familiar the staff room where people congregate the characters you meet all very very familiar so you do have to be able to be ready for walking in and you've got to you've got to assert your presence you've got to be seen in that corridor you've got to be seen as a teacher from day one because that's how you want the pupils to treat you if you hide away and treat yourself as a trainee who'll get involved at some other time how do you think people will treat you then. So you've got to be up for the noise, the chaos. You won't have your own office at the start. Uh, a, a lot of the time when I was um, in between lessons and prepping, I'm in the staff room. So you've got to be uh, prepared. A lot of us will come from backgrounds where we can control our time a little bit more and perhaps can go off and have a coffee or go and go into a separate room. You, you won't have those opportunities um, for, for a lot of your time there. So you've got to be prepared for that. But as Rob said, with that comes a huge amount of energy a huge amount of excitement and there is just it's lovely to be in an environment like that again after being in an office <laughs> great thank you and you sort of touched on the staff room now um what were your sort of experiences in terms of i know that sometimes people can be have lots of questions about coming as a career changer how you're received within schools um, how the other staff react to you, how the senior leadership team react to you. Um, uh, the majority of time, they're sort of the, the, your colleagues are quite considerably younger than you. So, how have you found your interactions with uh, staff and senior leadership and, and things within the school, Nathan? Very positive. Um, one of the things I learned early on from right at the start of my observations, without exception, every teacher I went to observe or every teacher I interacted with was generous with their time was thoughtful so it's been very very positive people have been very welcoming they're not quite sure what to make of us because we've done different things come with different experiences um, but I, I found it uh, very easy to talk to people they're very willing to engage they're very willing to share they're teachers they want to share experiences um, if you like your coffee get yourself a cafetiere and some nice coffee so you can at least get one nice cup of coffee during the day um, but I found it really, again, as Rob said, the, the staff rooms tend to have a nice flow through of people. It's a great place to meet people from outside your department. 
in your video, one of the guys talked about making special time to go back into the staff room and catch up with people there. So it's, it's a very important place. And again, don't hide away. You know, those are the places you need to go. You need to sit around. You need to make contacts with uh, make contact with people. You learn an awful lot. Yeah. Great. I think one of the one of the really good things with being a little bit older is that it never occurs to the children that you're a trainee. It doesn't no. occur to them that you're a starter um, in your beginning and that you don't that you haven't been doing this forever. So that's one yeah. really really positive thing about being a little bit older. Great. Yeah. Did you have anything to add, Rob, on sort of the culture well, of? School? Yeah. So w one thing I would add um, to, to what Nathan was saying is that um, I think the staff room is really important. But I've also spent a couple of weeks at another school where they didn't have a staff room um, okay. so but one thing I have discovered is that um, making if you can you can't maybe can't do this every day but if you can m try to have lunch in the canteen because if you have school dinners not only do you sometimes if the kids deign to accept you on their table sit with the kids and have lunch but more perhaps more importantly you can have lunch, you know, I'm a science teacher, but I would have lunch with the art department or with the maths department. And it's a really good way of building links and connections. So although sometimes when you have your 20 minutes of lunch break, you think I'm going to go and hide in a cupboard somewhere because that's what you really feel you need to do. Sometimes you need to just be brave and go and have lunch in the canteen. Great. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Um, OK. Uh, Right, so we move on to sort of the school day. Um, so I think sort of some people still think that being a teacher is just about imparting sort of subject knowledge to uh, groups of teenagers in front of you. Um, it'd be great to get an idea of exactly what goes on in your school days and, and all the sort of other things that are covered. So um, Nathan, could you maybe sort of start that off? What time do you get into school and what sort of, you know, what, what's an overview of your day? So. I think it's really important to understand when your school opens. Schools open at different times, some are 8.30, some are 8.40, some are 9am. Preschool is a really, really good time to catch up with the department you're in and to catch up with the mentor or the teachers who are observing you. That's when they, that's the time a lot of teachers use to catch up with their colleagues as well. So it fits in well with their day. So generally, uh, I was aiming to get in about an hour before the start of the day. I was often in a bit earlier because I was doing some prep or getting my materials for lessons ready, but aim to be in about an hour before the day starts so that you're around people, you can ask the questions, they can interact with you as well. Um, you may be asked to uh, take part in form time. So in my second school, uh, I've been observing form time as well. So that's a, a start to the day, you sit in, that's, as you saw in the video, it's a really good way to see a slightly different a different part of your role as a teacher and also a different side of a lot of the kids um, you then throughout your day you will have teaching time you will also want to have time to prep your materials so you need to be quite organized about when those periods are going to be you need to be very clear with when you're going to catch up with the people you need to catch up with so you will have mentor time once a week you need to make sure you know when that is and that you're prepared for that uh, I did some uh, break time duties. Uh, as Rob said, I made time as often as I could to go and sit into the canteen. And the best time to do it on, the best day to do it on, is the one where you really, really don't feel like doing it, where you've had a bad morning or your lesson's not gone as you planned. Get back out there, get in front of the children and other staff, and it really pays dividends. Generally, at the end of the day, staff are around. Uh, our department meetings um, at different schools. I've had department meetings before school. I've had them after school. Most schools will also do continuing professional development after school. So you will need to build that in. I think mine in my last school, there were two afternoons per month for that. And after school again is a useful time perhaps to debrief. It's a useful time to uh, work on some materials. But again, as you saw in that video, one of the key things you need to do is work out what your boundaries are in terms of times you can be in school and times when you are going to go home and you're going to step out. Great, thank you. And because you got involved with running some after some um, extracurricular clubs as well, didn't you? 
I did. Um, I went to a history and politics club in the first school and a rugby club in the second school. Again, really, it, it, they were both wonderful because you get to engage with and see a different, you get to engage differently with the kids. You see a different side of, of the children as well. So if you can, and there are the opportunities, make the time to do that. It is also very good to do those things uh, for the purposes of qualification, uh, for completing your trainer, your, your teacher standards as well. Right, okay. Um, and then I know you're doing a PGCE. Some people watching will be sort of taking on PGCE, some will be doing QTS only, but there are other assignments as well that you have to complete. So they're sort of completely outside the school day, are they, in terms of workload? Your, your PGCE assignments are completed in your own time. Yes, yes, they are. And a, a lot of your lesson planning i i try to do i try to use my time in school if i had lesson planning i try to find a corner to carry on and doing that but as rob and francis have both talked about actually when you're in school a lot of the time you 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 should be and you are interacting with people you can't use it as prep time very efficiently so you need to build in when you're going to prepare your lessons and be very uh, very careful about when you are also going to build in your pgce work so before you start your year, I didn't understand when the assignments would have to be in and the sort of levels of input that would be required before those assignments. So before you start in September, the more information you can get about what uh, what's going to be required for the PGC in terms of timing and dates for submission will be very helpful. Great. So coming from a career in law, how has your workload sort of compared with the, the workload you had as a lawyer? It's been very high. It's um, I've worked very, very hard. Um, part of that is because uh, I would keep going back to lessons I'd planned and tinker with them. So part of that is down to me um, getting better habits. Um, but it is a lot of work. It is incredibly rewarding, but it is a lot of work. Great. Thank you. Um, Rob, do you have sort of comments? I know you've, you've sort of talked about corridor duties and other things that you've done but how was your day sort of broadly similar to Nathan's or were there differences yeah I think I think the way Nathan described it I fits pretty well with with, with what my day, days have been like um, in the school that I was in we were as trainees were expected to co um, teach a form group every day almost from the beginning so I've been doing that for a while. I had a bit of a break from it, but I did that most of the time I was there. Um, and that is a good way to get to know kids that you, you know, some of the children in that group I did teach, but lots of them I didn't. So it's been a good way to get to know different children. Um, um, my school, time, the, the form, students yeah, form, talk about a, a current affairs or some sort of PhD. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it varies from school to school, I'm sure. But but in the school I was in, it was quite it was that what went on in form time was prescribed from above so you didn't just have a free form chat each day was a different thing that had to go had to have one day it was current affairs and the school would provide uh, an article which you were expected to discuss so the whole school was doing the same thing i um, mean another day it would be some kind of phse you know, some something to do maybe with like sexual health or something that you'd be discussing with them. um but but things that were um you know different from what you would be doing in class uh, I think one one thing I'd like to say just quickly is about the workload. Is I people people go on and on about how hard teachers work, and teachers do work really hard. There's no doubt about it. My workload is very high, but I don't think we should be, you know, we shouldn't forget that lots of the people that are listening to this, myself included, in my previous job, we all worked pretty hard anyway. I mean, it, it's not, it's it's, you know, it's a job, and you work hard, but. You can still leave it at school. I mean, I, I have been, especially with the now teach, you know, working four days a week, I have been able to protect my weekends generally. My weekends, I very, very, very occasionally during the year, I might have to, because I live very near the school I teach in, I might go in for an hour on a Sunday afternoon, but I've done that about three times. Um, generally, my weekends are precious. I have a relatively young family. I'm not going to ruin my life to do this. Um, mm. So although the workload is high, it's manageable. Um, yeah. And you know, lots of the people listening to this would have had high stress, high in you know high intensity careers before, so they shouldn't be too too alarmed by it. Because um, you know, I just wanted to get that say that. 
yeah no that's really that, that's really helpful thank you um i think uh francis are there additionally with you're on the university route so when you're on when you're on your school placements are your days sort of broadly similar to, to nathan and rob's or are there other things that you get involved with that, that would be very similar to that i think the pgc certainly my pgc they, they put their assignment handing in dates at the end of half term or at the end of a holiday so that they can right. guarantee you spend the whole of your half term or your whole of your um holiday doing that so which is good actually in many ways because it means you're not having to not, not having to do it um you know while you're trying to plan lessons at the same time so you do have time to do it um in addition i think to the things that um rob and nathan have mentioned um displays classroom displays you get involved in in sort of helping to to make classroom displays for parent teacher evenings or for um options evenings for for year nine options evenings things like that um and any fastballs that come along and i think you've just got to be prepared to be part of the team so that if a fastball comes along you're not walking out of the door at three o'clock saying well i'm okay jack you know i'm off um home you know you, you just carry on with that you you've got to be part of the team and then if you're part of the team they will give they will give everything back to you as well and i think that's 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 probably the the, the main thing but i think probably we're we're possibly more resilient than than some of the youngsters i don't know whether that's that's true a generalization but i think probably having had previous careers we have built in resilience that we have learned over those years and so yeah it's hard work um it's new work um i mean doing the maths test for me last year was extraordinarily hard work um mm -hmm. so you know there's always a challenge that comes along that you know you think oh god how am i going to manage this but you turn to the right and you just get on with it you know and um and i i think it's 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 great fun and you you, you get great rewards from it great and there was other training i think you mentioned sort of make, training on sen and and pupil premium training and things which yeah, CPD, well. um, we do cpd again after school but also in my first week at school in both schools we had send um pupil premium training um special needs all that that those sort of things and also i was able to encourage to, to trail a pupil around other lessons and i that was at the beginning, but actually I asked to do it later and it was really valuable because there was a boy in one of my classes who I was finding particularly difficult. And I thought, well, is it me or is it is it him? And so I was able to go and ask if I could go and watch him in other classes with more experienced teachers to see how they dealt with him, to see if it was it was any different. He was bad with him as well, so it wasn't too bad. But you know, it's very interesting to, to, to sometimes go and watch a child who you find particularly difficult or you you just want to know about to see how more experienced teachers deal with them um and that's yeah. that, I yeah. find that very helpful yes I that's, think you that's, that that's sorry, well. I... yes sorry Nathan. Yeah. sorry that, that's incredibly valuable you do a lot of observing classes at the start don't be in a rush to get into teaching it will come take your time use the observations at the start to understand about behavior management other things we'll talk about but even once you're well into your year, one of the most valuable experiences I've had, like Francis, is going and watching the children in different classes being taught by different people outside of my subject area. That really is incredibly value and valuable and really, really useful. And I, I think that'd be a, a really good thing to make time for later on in the year as well. And can I just jump in on that one, just um, because we had a direct question from someone in the audience about how soon you start to teach a full lesson. And you just mentioned there about not being in a hurry and doing observations. Um, I just wonder if we could just get a, um, an idea of how soon that was for each of you and how much you did observations at the start. Um, should I go first? Yeah. Yes. Uh, in my programme, we didn't get any choice about when you taught your first lesson my first lesson was timetabled i think it was the second week of term um and um the, you know that was that was it they uh, from the beginning i was timetabled to teach six lessons a week and once those lessons started i was i was teaching um i i totally agree that observing other teachers is a really really powerful thing and certainly at the very beginning when i didn't have maybe tons of other demands i do wish i had spent more of those free periods going to watch other people teach uh, and one last thing before i move on from that is i have discovered that you learn a lot by watching other trainees teach so if you've got other trainees in your school that you've made friends with and things going to watch them teach 
is in some ways more useful than going to watch a really experienced teacher because you can see them trying out the things that you're trying out and you can see them making the mistakes that you're making. Whereas if you go and watch a really experienced teacher, they use some kind of weird teacher magic and the class will be totally well behaved with them and you can't see what it is they're doing sometimes. So it's quite good to see maybe younger or more junior teachers teaching as well. Okay, I've stopped now. Should I go next? Um, I started teaching, I think it was week three. I think the first week at school was all the SAND, the pupil trail, the, the um, pupil premium, all of those sort of statutory things that I had to do on my PGCE checklist. The second week was teacher observations, mostly my mentor watching her, um, but also going to watch other teachers um, teaching different subjects as well. And then week three, I was they asked me whether I wanted to do a starter or whether I wanted to go straight into to do the whole thing. And at that point, I just said, well, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, you, you might as well just go and do the whole lesson. So I started in week three um, doing the, the whole lesson. And that was that was it from then on in. You've frozen, Joe. Mm. Yeah. Oh, dear, We're, we've lost. We've lost yeah. Joe. She's frozen. Shall I? <laughs> I'll, I'll do my bit to yeah. fill some time. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, fairly similar. I started, I think it was the third week, in school and I had the first week uh, in our curriculum center so we had a first week doing lectures on um, uh, on send and various other things and then it was about my third week I had quite uh, quite a gentle introduction to teaching I taught a couple of part lessons to start with um, which is actually really hard to um, to coordinate with someone to teach part of a lesson uh, but was actually quite useful um, and the school I was at to start with, took it very steadily so I built up to six hours over uh, over several weeks um, and, and that was fine I was chomping at the bit but um, as Rob said um, if you have spare time don't be in too much of a rush to teach you will do a lot of teaching what you won't have time for later on is the observing observing other trainees really good idea as observing other teachers and for me um, I, I teach history uh, for me, I've had to do quite a bit of work on my knowledge uh, base as well. Um, and in those early weeks, that's a brilliant time to do that. So don't be in too much of a rush. Make the most of your observations and start um, building up your knowledge base for, the, for when you do, do your teaching. Um, one thing I should, I should add about my experience, although they got me teaching quite near the beginning of term, my training provider... Um, a part of the deal is that I had to go to two weeks of summer school in the middle of the summer. So the first two weeks of August, I had uh, I spent with 80 other ARC teacher trainers, trainees, um, going through all the behaviour policies and playing game, you know, scenarios of you know us pretending we were in the classroom and being taught behaviour management skills. And we had to do that for two weeks. And that was a compulsory part of my my training program. So I had that before I set foot in the school in September. Great, thank you all. Um, I don't know if Jo's still here um, uh, on audio or whether she's disappeared completely, so I'll just um, step in and carry on with some questions. Uh, um, so, um, just you mentioned subject knowledge just then, um, so uh, just thought it would be good to touch on that a little, a little bit. Did you, maybe a question to Francis, did you, before you were starting, were you concerned about your levels of subject knowledge or was that something that, that came easily to you? I suppose um, my subject knowledge, because it's languages, it's slightly different in that um, the knowledge is there um, and it's always been there and it's stayed there and I, because I've kept my languages up. But what it, what I don't have to do is go and learn a whole new subject, you know, like Oxbow Lakes or whatever in, in geography. I don't have to go and learn a whole new topic. Um, I just have to, to make sure I can remember why you do things in a certain way and why certain grammar rules apply and also be able to explain it to other people and to find creative ways of doing it. So for me, it wasn't so much the subject knowledge, it was imparting it to learning how to impart it and also you know when I learned French and Spanish um, at school and university you know we didn't divide into speaking reading writing and listening you know I wasn't aware that we did and I'm sure the teachers did you know um, divided up into those those four components but you know I you just had to sort of bring myself up to date and, and make sure that I was doing ticking every box which I you know wasn't aware my teachers were doing when I was at school yes absolutely <laughs> And Rob, so you, uh, we mentioned earlier about teaching all three sciences um, mm, you know, to a certain yeah. level. How was that for you? 
Well, I mean, it, it, the science curriculum up to GCSE is pretty broad, so it's 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 hard to know. You, you know, you, none of it is none of it is terrifying to a, to somebody that's interested in science, but there's a lot of stuff to know. So um, I was very happy to be offered uh, this knowledge enhancement, the SKE thing that you can do um, before you take up your training. Um, but I had this slightly bizarre situation that since I'm a physics trainee, they offered me an SKE only in physics. And of course, it's not the physics that was my problem. It was the biology and the chemistry, which I have to teach. So I ended up um, having to throw my weight around a little bit to convince them to let me do some biology and chemistry. Um, but still, they mainly made me take a knowledge enhancement course in physics, um, which was a lot of fun, but didn't necessarily necessarily improve my knowledge of physics, because I, you know, I felt I was quite comfortable with that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to cover, and just as Francis said, so much of it is not really the the fundamental knowledge that you're struggling with. It's it's how to break it down and how to think about it in terms of teaching it, and that's that's wrapped up with the whole skill of learning to be a teacher, which is what we're always doing anyway. Right, I'm just going to put my face on the screen so that I'm not just a voice from beyond. Hello everyone. Um, so uh, Nathan, do you have anything to add on subject knowledge and getting up to speed? Yes, uh, so teaching history, um, there is again an awful lot of ground to cover um, and one of the key things for me if I was to look to do this again is um, find out what um, the school you're going to, what the curriculum is for the year groups you're likely to be teaching. Okay, so as you start, you're likely to be teaching year seven, eight, and nine, or a combination of those. For me, the summer before I started, I, I was still working, but I also got sent a reading list, which was very broad, and I, I embarked on um, the Romans, um, when in fact it was the Normans and the Vikings I needed to know about uh, for, for when I started actually teaching. So um, if you can talk to your school, have a dialogue with them, they can't be precise about what you're going to teach, but they can give you um, copies of the, the curriculum and the scheme of work that you're going to be doing. And then you can focus if you're worried uh, and you want to brush up, you can then focus your efforts on the, um, on on the, the learning that you're going to be teaching uh, first. Ah, thank you. And I can see that Joe's back again. Uh, some technical difficulties <laughs> there. So I will. Why my lack? I will. Just a it's always at the worst times, isn't it? Um, I'll, I'll take my face away again. Um, but we were just talking about subject knowledge there, Joe, in case you missed it. And um, I think we're ready to move on to behaviour, a bit about behaviour management. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Lindsay, for stepping in. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so behaviour management, I think as the poll said at the beginning, um, it is a, a topic of concern for, for a lot of people coming into teaching. Um, Rob, I know you're in a school with quite a lot of challenging behaviour. Um, you know, how, how do you manage that where you taught techniques? What are your sort of, you know, how have you dealt with, with behaviour management? Okay, well, um, you're right, Joe. my school does have some challenging behavior being manifested um, uh, whilst you were offline I mentioned to the audience that um, ARC the training provider that I have um, in part of the requirement was that we went to two weeks of summer school where we were given lots of training on behavior management they basically taught us a, a, a set of a kind of a hierarchy of tools that you can use from very low in low, you know, non-invasive low impact things to you know the full the full discipline um, and they trained us through this and and although I felt a bit grumpy about losing my two weeks of my summer holidays last summer I without that training going into a classroom would have been impossible for me um, the skills that they've taught me are amazing some of them are really obvious some of them are just common sense things like you hear the phrase narrate the positive which you know sounds really cheesy but I tell you it works if you, rather than telling off the naughty kid, if you start talking about the, the children in the class that are doing good things, it's amazing how effective that is. Things like not calling out the person who is misbehaving, so anonymously correcting them. So saying when somebody's talking and you've already asked the class to be quiet, you go, I can still hear somebody talking. You know, then, then you're not in a confrontation with that person. So and there's, yeah. a whole, there's a whole set of skills like this that we've been taught 
the trick is remembering when to use them and using them appropriately, not escalating the 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 the, the, the procedure too quickly and things like that. And these are these are skills that actually become become better. But most importantly, before, most importantly, before I give over to anybody else, is what it's all about really is the developing relationships with the children. So even the hardest kid in the class, you've got to chip away at it. There's one kid in one of my classes that has been really very, very abusive and rude to me uh, in nearly every lesson. But every lesson I go over to his desk and I tell him I want to be there. I tell him I want to be his teacher and I will not give up on it. And I do that every lesson. Um, and you know that's, that's, that's what it's about. And but gradually building up those relationships is probably the most rewarding thing about being a school teacher as well. I think you'd probably all sort of agree with that, wouldn't you? That sort of it's fundamental to just get those relationships going with the children as early as possible. Um, Nathan, have you got anything to sort of add about behaviour management and and sort of how you've approached that? Yeah, I think um, it, it. Everyone knows that's going to be one of the hardest things to learn and to get on top of. So you you've got space to try things out and to make mistakes as you go along, okay? So you're allowed to make mistakes, you're allowed to get it wrong, all right? Um, key for me is we have so much going on in our training year. So with behavior, start by learning and understanding fully and discussing with various different people what the behavior policies are in your school. Get that absolutely understood so you're comfortable with that because if you're not comfortable with that, you'll be thinking about it in the lesson, you'll be trying to teach, and it, it becomes much, much harder. Get really, really comfortable with what those rules are, get, and then you can implement them, okay? And you start by implementing the rules, start by understanding the policies, and then you can add the extra bits that, that Rob was talking about. You can add the positivity as well. Um, but even when you're in a class and someone is observing you and it's technically their other class, you're expected to be in control, okay? They expect you to be in control. And one of the things that I learned was I was a bit too timid at the start. I was trying to think about what would that observer do in this circumstance? You can't. You're going to have to control that class. You're going to have to form those relationships, which are going to be positive, and they will have some problems occasionally. But you're gonna to have to do it. So from the start, understand what the policies are, and then implement them as you think you need to. And then you'll get observation, you'll get feedback, and you can refine it from there. Brilliant, great. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add to that, Francis? I, I absolutely agree that you've got to understand the, the behaviour policy and know how well it's implemented in the school and how consistently it's implemented, because there's no point having a, a, a policy if nobody follows it. And um, in my first school, certainly every single person followed exactly the same policy. They all understood it really well. It was written everywhere. The children understood it, the, the teachers understood it, and it was really well implemented. I found that was not so good in my second school, that um, there was a lot of, oh yeah, well, I would do that, but I'm not going to do it this time, I'll do it next time. And so the, the children weren't in quite the same position as they were in my first school, where they absolutely knew what was going to happen to them if they did certain things and, and, and breached certain rules. But I think consistency is the, is the big takeaway from that, is that yeah. if you can, I think, you know, if the school implements the policy consistently, then you will be supported if you follow that system as well um, but you're always going to have your own things that you're going to bring into it and your own things that you do um, as part of your own personality um, that you just have to you just have to go with because it's it's part of who you are but they've got to understand what you expect in your classroom and, yeah. and you have to be consistent and not and, and if you're not consistent on one occasion I mean, there was one one occasion when I think I got it wrong and I got them in afterwards I got them to stay behind afterwards and I said look I'm really sorry I, it wasn't you, it was you, you know, I blamed the wrong person for the wrong thing. I'm sorry, I got it wrong. And that, I think, I think probably accepting that you're going to get it wrong sometimes is, is okay. I think Can I just jump in with a couple of audience questions, if that's okay? Yeah. Um, so, yes. uh, obviously, lots of people wanting to know about uh, behaviour management. So, um, I've got two questions here. So, one is just 
Um, have you got examples of that? You did touch on it a little bit there, but examples of what quote unquote bad behaviour looks like in school. Um, and then the second question is um, about how you go about asserting authority without closing down communication channels with the young people. You'd like to pick up on that one, Rob? Do you want to? Yeah. So, so behaviour, bad behaviour. I mean, generally in the classrooms I teach, the kind of bad behaviour is children that just aren't very comfortable in a classroom environment so they're children that find it very difficult to sit still very difficult to be quiet very difficult to focus and you know it, it's tough for them really tough for them to be stuck in a in a school environment um so it, it's it really difficult there's one or two children that i teach that they will even though i try to manage them very carefully and i really try to work with them nearly every lesson they escalate all the way through the behavior policy and end up getting either removed from my class or end up in a detention by the end of it and i, I have tried so hard so many different things with some of my children um but the thing, and, they'll be the same children in other subjects as well they'll be doing it in every class they're in probably yeah yeah although it is it is quite fascinating because certainly some of the children have already kind of they have affinity for certain subjects so some children you know might be brilliant brilliantly behaved in music for example but they yeah. might not they might not be happy in a science classroom yeah was the second was there a second part of the question actually lindsay oh the second yes. part was how do you not ruin the relationship yeah, yeah. it's just about how yeah how do you assert authority but not close down those communication channels yeah consistency i think consistency is really really important and and when you do have these issues just like francis said you know sometimes you just get a child to stay behind in break time and chat to them and it might start off as being a really unpleasant aggressive conversation but after five or ten minutes you've got to know them a bit better and you're having a proper chat and that can make all the difference yeah yeah great um another aspect that um, people are always keen to know about is the sort of the support you get as a trainee in school um the various mentors and things um nathan how sort of how how's that worked how's the mentoring and the support you've had in schools work from in both with your school and from your training provider the the mentoring has um, has been good. It tends to be someone in your department. Uh, it tends to be someone who is going to observe, um, in my experience, the majority of the lessons, uh, so that as they are being your mentor, they also have real experience of how you are in the classroom. Um, the we then we then have um, what's called curriculum centre days. So we have our lectures on education studies and picking up how we teach particular aspects of history on Fridays. And the history subject lead who leads that it has been really supportive, really helpful, really uh, thoughtful. Um, so I found it, it it's good. But sometimes people will assume you're OK and sometimes you won't engage well enough with people. And so I think it is also important to keep asking. If you've got questions, keep finding people to talk to. It will often be your mentor, but it won't always. And as I said before, you know, I have been pretty overwhelmed actually by how um, prepared people are to give up time and talk to you and support you. Yeah, yeah, because you are starting again, aren't you? So it's, yeah, people expect you to, you're, you're not expected to know everything. It's, it's great to ask those questions. A, a lot of us come from, be, come from positions where we're the expert in the room and, and we no longer are the expert in the room. And um, it's that's that's lovely in some respects, and it's frightening in others. Um, but there are lots and lots of experts out there. They don't have to be the people just you know in in your immediate department. And I think one of the things I would do more of earlier on is talk to different people and raise different issues with them. Yeah, I think your your mentor. You've got to make your mentor your best friend. Um, You've got to ask advice consistently, constantly. People love to be asked for advice and you have to defer to them because they are your mentor. And for us, I think sometimes that can be quite frustrating in that sometimes we think we know better. We don't in this case necessarily because they've got much more experience, but sometimes, you know, in, with my first mentor, she was really, really nice, really experienced teacher, but she would tell me things 
that she wasn't doing herself and she would tell me that yeah. you know she would do a critique on me and say well you should do this and you should do that and I was inside I was thinking well yeah but you don't do that but zip it you don't say it you just say oh yeah thank you very much thank you oh yes that's really that's very interesting that's very helpful thank you very much you just defer to everything they say because you need them on your side yeah yeah I don't, I don't want to sound cynical there because you know both, both my mentors have been really really fantastic people but just occasionally you know, it, it, it's you get a frustrating moment where you think Arr. brilliant okay um i think if we sort of just wrap up with the this sort of formal q a and then we'll have some time to go to more questions from the audience actually um if we could just maybe have one final comment from each of you um, your advice from a from a year in what would you what would you say to yourself a year ago what would that be Rob do you have anything any insights on that yeah um, I think um, well I think one thing that I would do better if I could do it again would be and Nathan touched on this I think already um, I think both Francis and Nathan is make sure that you are very familiar with the policies of the school before you start being in charge of a classroom because if you're not very comfortable with what the policies of the school are you can't do you can't you can't manage that classroom properly and all of those inconsistencies and those compromises you make come back to haunt. So if you know the, the kids, that's the you know that, that's one of the hardest things I have with one of the classes that I teach now, is that I've been with them since the beginning, and I've made a lot of mistakes with them, and a lot of their behaviour, their bad behaviour, is down to the fact that I haven't been consistent all the way through, and I can see that. I'm quite looking forward to next year when we finally get back into a classroom, to being able to start again with a fresh class and not make those mistakes again. Um, so that's that's one thing but it's it, you know i'm not sure that even if i knew that if i started again i'd get it right so it's a hard thing to hard thing to do but looking at the part i mean i guess that people things people can be doing before they go into school as well once they've got their school offer they know which school they're, they're going to be going into they can be starting to look at the school policies and things like that so yeah and 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 you know right at the beginning you need to get to know the other teachers so so it's really important to get to know as many of the other teachers on those first few days back at school not just the ones in your own department but all of you know as many school teachers in the school because as nathan said they're all going to be useful to you so make a network as soon as you get in great okay nathan do you have any advice to yourself from a year ago take your time at the start oh. um as we talked about and we keep going on about sorry Okay, for me to carry oh. on. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, you hear. froze slightly, but yeah. Okay. Um, as we've talked about, you know, take your time at the start. Understand the policies. Understand the school you're going into. Uh, I think I would also uh, talk to myself about being very clear about how I'm going to organise my time over the coming year, and I would just reassure myself. Uh, that it is brilliant and you will not regret it you will love it and it is um, it is a fantastic opportunity that's great that's great to hear thank you Francis I think I would say don't beat yourself up too much you know give yourself a bit of a break you know you've got it's gonna be hard but it's doable um, and don't set your standards so impossibly high you know we're, we're all had previous careers in some cases people we've been the boss maybe and so we're now you know back at the bottom of the pile again um and so we want to be the best but you can't be the best uh, when you're starting out and you've just got to accept that and get on with it um but it, it's it's very rewarding and, and and good fun as well um the only thing i would say is um put a guillotine and a laminator on your christmas list <laughs> I did, and i got them both in my stocking <laughs> Great, thank you. That's a good note to finish on. Um, Lindsay, do we have other questions that members of the audience have asked? 
Yes, we do. There's been some really great questions coming through. Um, apologies in advance that we might not get around to all of them. Um, but I wanted to just start with a question um, on the hot topic, obviously, COVID-19. Um, so we've had a few sort of different variations of questions from Jan, Terry, Kenny and Paul. Um, but I guess it would just be great to hear a little bit about how your situation has adapted since uh, lockdown and, and what you've been doing in terms of your training. Um, but also whether you've got any insight into what's being said about how schools will look from September as well. If you'd like to start with that. <laughs> I've been doing um, my assignment. Um, I've also been doing, uh, there's been a lot of CPD, both through Now Teach has been putting on some fantastic um, sessions for us, but also university has also been putting on a lot of CPD. And the, the emphasis has really been on mental health for children, mental health for teachers, mental health for families. Um, what isn't being mentioned is behaviour management and how that's going to be different. And I think that even the most experienced teacher is going to be in the same position as us when we go back, whenever that will be, in that we don't really know quite what we're going to expect from children who have been feral for the last um, however many months who haven't been um, strictly at school. But I know the school, I've, I'm going to, I've got a job in a school um, starting in September and I know they're doing online lessons and those sorts of things. I haven't been um, able to do any of that with them, but I have been, I'm getting involved in preparing bits and pieces um, for, for next year and reading myself into the GCSE curriculum because I will be straight into teaching a, a year 11 class, be coming back in in September as a year 11 class to do GCSEs in May, June next year. And there's not going to be a lot of time for me as an NQT to get them through their GCSE. So I'm doing a lot of work on um, GCSE curriculum stuff because I, I think I need to be right on top of that. Yeah. Rob, have you had any anything from the school you'll be in next year about how things might be different? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm still having quite a lot from the school I'm in. So I'm changing schools for, for my NQT year. And in fact, my new contract starts on the 1st of July. Um, but at the moment, I'm still working for my current school. And I am, the way we've split up the responsibilities is that two teachers are responsible for each year group. And so I'm sharing responsibility for year sevens. Um, my workload is very, pretty small because what we do is we plan our lessons and we, we're not doing live teaching. We're giving them links to BBC Bite Size and other lessons that other people have prepared. But my role each week is to prepare them, sort of starter questions and things for them to do to get them up and running with each lesson. So I'm doing a bit of, bit of stuff like that. Um, my training provider has carried on with our training schedule as before the COVID hit um, but instead of having face-to-face -face sessions once a week we now have online sessions where they set us an assignment every week and that takes a good two or three hours of work every week um, as well so so you know I, I, I'm my, my workload is much less than it was when it was in school but I'm still doing quite a lot at the moment and as far as the second part of your question is what's it going to be like when we go back in September your guess is as good as mine. I've got no idea. Yeah, but I think we don't think so. Back in July. I mean, you said, that, Rob, that your your contract is starting in July, and I'm. I was specifically asked that question when I went for interview: was Would you be prepared to start work in July if we go back before um, the summer yeah. holidays? at the interview you say yes of course. Um, but yeah. that would be really beneficial, I think, for us to get into mm. school in July so that we can mm. meet. Even if it's just the year 10 children or, or, or whoever it's going to be. And some of the other teachers too, yeah. And the teachers before next term. So that's what I'm hoping for, yeah. certainly. Uh, and yeah. also we get paid over the summer holidays. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to move on from that one. Um, sorry to, to cut you off and not give you a chance, Nathan, but just because we've got a few other questions. Um, so perhaps I can start with you on, on these next ones um, that are to do with lesson planning. Um, so we've had a question from Lucy about how do you balance um, lesson planning and any sort of PTC or other work that you've got going on? Um, and a question from York about how long does it take to plan a lesson? Um, planning <laughs> lessons for me, uh, for history, has, has been a big challenge. Uh, I've had to learn some of the knowledge uh, as well as learning how best to structure those lessons and structure the imparting of information. Um, you, different lessons take different amounts of time to plan. 
you take longer at the start than you do uh, as you as you get on it as you go through the year. So I don't think there's any kind of fine you know, definite period that it takes. It takes hours usually to to plan a lesson that you're going to make interesting because you're not just putting information. Uh, down, you're working out what the different uh, ways are that you you get the children to engage. Um, one of the things that I would say that I could have done better at the start is focus very early on on lesson planning tools. Each school and each provider uh, will have their own lesson planning tools. Uh, they'll have their own approaches and their own ideas. Again, as you observe and as you run up to to starting, I'd suggest talking to them about uh, what lesson planning tools they have, how they plan the lessons, what format they use for the lesson plans, and I would start looking at those and getting familiar with those um, because it, it, it can take a, it can take a lot of time. How do you balance it? Um, as Rob said, um, and, and as Francis said, I think you, you've got to be very focused and very strict with your time and you've got to allocate when you are going to work. If you've got assignments to do, as Francis said, for the PGCE, they put them at the end of half terms or holidays. Uh, they call them reading weeks instead of holidays, in my experience. Um, and I hadn't quite understood the impact of that uh, before I started. So you've got to be very thoughtful and planned before you start the year. That will make it much, much easier. Great, thank you. Um, just, just a follow up to that, there was a, um, and, and feel free to jump in Francis or Rob, um, but uh, someone asked directly about whether there were specific themes of work or whether you planned a lot right from scratch. Um, I don't know if you've got differing, differing thoughts on that, Rob and Francis. I could, I, uh, um, so in, 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 the school, in the schools that I've been into with science teaching, quite often a science department will have a scheme of work already planned out so the science department you know you're not preparing every lesson for anywhere from scratch what you usually have is a, a slide stack and a bunch of resources available to you that you are expected to differentiate for your class so you might choose what you use and adapt things but very rarely are you creating things from scratch at the science department from my experience saying that over the course of the year you will end up creating some lessons from scratch that's what i've been doing for the last two or three weeks, my department asked me to plan for next year to create six or seven lessons on one particular topic so that they have that ready for next year. That's one of the things they've asked me to do for the last few weeks. So you will prepare lessons from scratch, but on a day-to-day -day basis in science, the, the, the curriculum is there and you are delivering material that has already been prepared. Right, have you found that as well with languages, Francis? Um, there, I mean, there's certainly a bunch of resources on, on the school um, drives, um, but, I tended to do it from scratch because I felt I needed to to know what how to do it quite right from scratch. So I certainly up to now I have done it from scratch. But I've of course got ideas from the resources that are there from the internet. Um, there's always you know so much out there. Um, you know, to, but it's it's a creative bit I think because there's you know you go to a, a school resort and you you get something pretty dry often um, and you, you need to try and more creative certainly in, in languages because um the children don't really see why they should be learning french and spanish most of the time and so you know i found that a lot of the resources that are available in school um lack a bit of imagination um so yeah but it's it, it's quite fun to do it yourself as well but the other thing about planning lessons is that if you're teaching two year seven classes you teach you know you, you prepare two year seven classes for one week but actually you might deliver it six times or four times because you've got two year seven classes and so you know there's only yeah. so much you can have to prepare i mean a, a year seven double lesson a year eight double lesson a year nine double lesson a year 10 and the year 11 that's probably the maximum you're going to have to actually prepare but for me i reckon i i, I used i think two hours for every hour lesson was about the right. average um okay as, that was really cool, thank you. Um, Andrew would like to know how much jargon is there and how many acronyms do you do you have to learn? Not as many as in the army. <laughs> um, I think there's a fair amount though. I mean, we do have a running joke amongst the other trainees about how, how many things are turned into little three or four letter abbreviations. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's modern life really. 
And I think we're putting together a pack of information actually, which we're, we're going to have sort of guides and things like that on our website and um, as well. So yeah, there'll, there'll be information on all the jargon that's used in schools available on our website for people to have a look at. Absolutely. Um, we've got a couple of history, uh, future history trainees on the, the line. So question for Nathan. How have you found the response to history um, as a subject from pupils? Do you find that they're quite engaged with it? Um, and also, what's the most valuable thing that you can do to improve your history knowledge? Sorry, you, you faded away at the end. Was that what's the most valuable thing you can do to build your knowledge? Yes. Your knowledge? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how engaged? Um, it, it, the spectrum. I, I suspect it's the same for all of us. Uh, there are some that really struggle with it. There are classes with massive ranges of reading ability in them. And if they are struggling read, to read, you're going to struggle to impart the information you need to impart quite often. So um, there's, there's a broad spectrum, um, but that's partly what makes it interesting. And that's also what pushes you to find interesting and engaging ways to teach it. Certainly more interesting and engaging than I ever had. Um, in terms of building knowledge, uh, get an idea of what the curriculum is going to be from your schools and then go and get the books from the library. My local library has been brilliant and just read as much as you can. The, the schools will have, some schools use lots of textbooks, some don't use very many. So again, in early engagement with the school, understand what's on the curriculum, understand if they use certain textbooks to teach that and ask for a copy over the summer as you're preparing and they i'm sure they'll give it give that to you and that'll give you a real insight into what the children are used to seeing as well that's a great that's a great tip thank you one of the challenges with the pgc route for me was that i didn't get my school placement until the thursday before mm. i was in the school on the monday on both occasions and so i couldn't do lots of preparation and finding out about about the schools in advance but you just got to make sure you, you do it when you, when you get there um and and ask yeah everyone's always there's nothing new in anything that we're teaching yeah okay Great. i think that we're, we're running short on time now and i think a few people are dropping off as well and having to go so i think we'll probably wrap up there with the questions but um if anyone has anything they want to ask directly uh, or us to, to pose to the trainees at a different time then to get in touch. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to Rob, Nathan and Francis. That's been really, really um, fascinating, interesting, insightful. I'm sure people have sort of got taken a lot away from that session. Um, we do have a couple of polls. I think we've got three polls to finish off with. We do really want to tailor these sessions to the um, you know, to what you want to hear. So please do give us some some honest feedback about this evening, so that we can sort of adapt um, and and make sure that you're as informed as as you can be. So the first poll is up now. Has that poll dropped off? Okay, there's our second poll as well. Okay, we have had a chance to complete that. And then I think we've got one more. Okay, now. Just while those are up, just, just to share, um, there's lots of people saying thanks. I know that Francis, Rob and Nathan, you can't see the, the comments yourselves. Um, so there's lots saying thank you for organising and for, um, for being so honest. Uh, all questions answered very, very honestly. Um, and yeah, just a massive thank you for being here and sharing your experience. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who's joined us this, this evening and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>